So today I'm here with Hilary de Caesar, who is an international business coach and best-selling author, among many other things. And I'm really excited to sit down and talk to you today to learn a little bit more about your work and some of the messages that you preach. So before we dive in, do you want to just take a quick second to introduce yourself? Angelica, it's so good to be here. And I love what you're doing. I love what you're, how you're highlighting people. And I hope that I can bring to your audience some new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things and leveling up to success. So yeah, so my whole history and the company that I now run is called Relaunch. And so with the name, you can kind of think about that I could potentially be called the relaunch queen. <laughs> All of these major transitions that have shaped my life that have allowed me to be where I am today talking to you. I grew up in the Silicon Valley, um, worked at a high tech company for almost 10 years, and then I was having babies. I had three. I was going through a divorce. I was, I got melanoma. There just was a lot of things hitting me that I knew I needed to make a change. And I started down the entrepreneurial road, started to work actually with a venture capital firm that the president of Oracle, the high tech company I was working at, had gone over to. And he called me and said, hey, will you come over and help our portfolio companies scale and grow their businesses? And I had done a lot of different things at Oracle around sales and marketing and I'm like, absolutely. And I did it and I loved it. And that literally started me down with launching and scaling companies. And I noticed that there were things that would hold back people from success. And they were usually the invisible things. They weren't the, you know, I'm not doing this step or I'm not, you know, doing that. And I wanted to, I wanted to give people the ability to not have to, and I had fallen victim to it too. I had just said, oh, you know, these are just things that you just have to put behind the door. And I call it hell in the hallway. Just keep closing the doors on everything that you don't want to have to deal with. Well, eventually, um, eventually the doors start to crack open and it, they did. And I um, went through what I now know was not necessarily a midlife crisis, but it was a midlife identity relaunch. And I knew I had to kind of figure it all out. So my journey for the last um, really 10 plus years, because I was a psychology major in college, um, has really been around neuroscience, has really been how do we take the art and the science and create a connection between business and your mind. I love that. And I love how you can kind of connect those two vastly different but related concepts and kind of use your own experiences to guide you through this new journey. So I like that you brought up that like you do have a psych background. I think that gives you some credibility. Um, so can you talk a bit about some of your work in neuropsychology and what that looked like? Mm. So it's really interesting. I um I came from, I always laugh whenever I'm on stage and I start to have to write on a, on one of those boards or anything. My writing is terrible and my, well, when I'm going fast, it's terrible, but my dad was a doctor and my grandfather was a doctor. So I always say, you know what? It's because of them. I write so poorly, <laughs> <laughs> but I really grew up with that. And when I went to college, I thought, oh, I'm going to be a doctor. And within about a year of going to school as pre-med, I'm like, I do not want to do this. But I was always fascinated by what I was learning about people, about how the mind works, the brain, and how we develop with others. And there was this, this commonality of like people were around my, I'm very, I'm curious, I guess, you know, you could say, in fact, I even had a uh, curious George painted on my kid's uh, room because I, I just think that there's something fascinating with always at, I, I didn't ever stop asking why, right? Like can little kids go through the why, 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 why? I still do that. So sometimes for my family, you know, poor them, but I still do it. And I realized that instead of being with like-minded people, where I really was fueled was like energy. 
And where does that come from? And why are there days you wake up and you feel really awful? Like you're just not like, hey, I went to bed. I had a good night of sleep, but it just, I just don't feel like I'm not happy. And I grew up in a family that, you know, just be happy, put on a happy face. Just, and, and really I have to say, I, I, I am a happy, my demeanor, my, my, I am happy, but here's the thing. I felt it was wrong when I wasn't happy. I felt there was something wrong with me if I woke up like this. So about 10 years ago, now it's probably even longer. I was um, going through yet additional relaunches and I've lost my mom. I've lost my dad, you know, one to cancer, one to, you know, heart disease. And there's just been just so many things. My kids are, you know, got very ill and there's just been a lot. There's been a lot of, um, you know, we've had a uh, suicide just in the, in the family. There's just been a lot of, a, a lot of relaunches and I wanted to understand what really was going on. So there was a day and I went to visit my mom and I was really at my wits end. You could say that, you know, it was kind of like the breaking point. And I remember sitting on a twin bed in one of her rooms and it had all these little monkeys all over it. One of those like weird prints. I'm like, what the heck? And she comes in and she says, Hey, this book just came out. You need to read it. And it was the secret. And I'm like, what? And it was, you know, one of those, like, this is the ancient wisdom. And so it takes all of about what 90 minutes to read that thing. I read it and it was talking all about the law of attraction. And I thought, okay, let's see. You know, I'm one of those like push the edges of everything. Like, let's see if that really does work, all that mind stuff. And I went into the book and I found this one gentleman, John Asaraf. And I'm like, I like his story the most, uh, that he came from nothing. And then was able to, with, you know, this approach, be able to get into a, you know, very successful millionaire plus type of person. I'm like, okay, I want to meet this guy. I want to coach his elite coaches. I want to, and I put down a few more things and I want this to happen in six weeks. And then I thought, wait a second, that's like, just think it and it will happen. I'm like, okay. Do I really believe that? I want to put down action items. So I got a piece of paper out and I kind of quickly put down, if I were to, to coach his elite coaches in his top business program, what would I coach them on? And so I put down very quickly, like, here's what I would coach them on. Well, six weeks later, I'm in an environment where I look across the hall and I'm like, oh my God, that's John Asaraf. No way. And of course, for me, I have been thinking about him. And so I felt like we were long lost friends. So I went up to him. I'm smiling, thinking like, oh, this is beyond incredible. And he kind of looks at me like, yeah, you know, I don't really know who you are, but I'm trying to be polite. One of those looks that, you know, people give you like, yeah, okay. And so finally I just said, you know, I got to tell you, I manifested you law of attraction and I know you're going to end up hiring me to coach your elite coaches. And he's like, whoa, yeah, that's a really, you know, great. Well, it ended up that years later I did coach his elite coaches and it got me more and more intrigued curious about neuroscience. So I began to study under John. I studied under some of the top um, people out there. I took, you name it, if there's a certification courses, I was all in. And, and it's interesting because I now live right near uh, University of Colorado and I've already looked into additional courses. And I just, I'm, I'm literally a neuro junkie right now. Like I can't get enough of it. And what I really realized is my experience, my experience and my expertise falls so nicely with business, with entrepreneurship, getting out of your own way, what's holding you back. And here's what I've learned. If I can, if I can just say, Hey, net it out. We all have something that I call bugs, beliefs, underground surfacing. We all have bugs. And it's a matter of time when your bugs are going to crawl out from those closed doors. 
And when you can really think about what in your life is not working for you, that's where usually your bugs are. If there's something, because the universe is never going to hold you back from what you ultimately want. You're going to hold yourself back. Wow. I love that the law of attraction played a factor in that. I think when I first read The Secret, when I watched the documentary, I hope everybody who watches it kind of has those like internal thoughts of like, wow, what if this is true? Like, what if I can do this in my life? And it's really awesome to hear stories like yours who kind of do take that action. And it's more than just thinking about it and manifesting it. You actually have to put in the work. So it's really inspiring to hear like a story like that to show that it is possible. And I'm wondering what came first, the law of attraction thing or your entrepreneurial journey? I would say definitely the entrepreneurial journey. Um, I was, I think my very first entrepreneurial journey was, um, my parents were getting divorced and there were a bunch of items out in the hallway. And so I decided to take it on myself that I was going to put on my own form of a garage sale and I did it in my bedroom. So I started to take all these things and there was a pair of clogs that I guess my mom had gotten when she was a young girl in Holland, her, my grandparents had taken her. And I wrote five cents in pen on the bottom of the clog. And of course, somebody came in and they're like, I'm going to give you five cents. And there were, there were dresses, there were knickknacks. I mean, you name it, I was willing to sell anything. <laughs> and I did. And so my mom comes back and says, hey, where is everything? And I had sold about half of it. I said, oh, well, you know, I, I heard you saying that you were concerned about money and what we were going to do. So I sold and here's all this money I have. And it was like, you know, a dollar, a dollar 50 or something. And she was like, you did what? <laughs> and so she had to go back to everyone that I had sold and recollect these items. But she always laughed that, you know, she would flip something over and it would be what I had valued it at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that the clogs were only five cents, but there was this, you know, stuffy that I had put, you know, 25 cents worth. <laughs> so clearly these things come naturally to you. You're just an entrepreneur by nature. When you actually took that step into more than just a garage sale into like a real serious career, what was that process like for you? Like, what were some of the limiting beliefs you had during that? What were you really confident in? Can you expand on that a little? I absolutely can because I think that I hear this from so many different individuals. I think that, you know, and I, from that point on, I continued to start businesses. I had a clothing company in college that basically allowed me to travel to Europe with a year rail pass. And I, I constantly was um, looking for, you know, how can I support myself? How can I make sure that I'm successful? And one of the things that I talk about in my book, Relaunch, Spark Your Heart to Ignite Your Life, is that one of the biggest fears that women have is becoming a bag lady and not having enough money. And what if the well runs dry? And so for me, I was highly motivated. I saw my mom um, not just, you know, not have money, but, you know, a few things that she had to go through as we were kind of moving from a house to an apartment to a kind of a smaller apartment to a smaller apartment, I realized then and there that I wanted to make sure that I could scale any business I start. And I set my curious mind to making sure that I could do that. How do you do it? How do, what are the most successful systems out there, processes out there? And one of the things that happened to me is I had had great success at Oracle. And so after 10 years, I thought I can, I can do anything. I'm like, you know, I got it. And I started to go after entrepreneurship thinking I could just learn as I go. And I made so many mistakes. I mean, I, you know, companies that scaled too fast, um, I then, you know, had one company where a board member literally took us down, ended up, he, uh, did a Ponzi scheme with us. He went to federal prison for three years, uh, just crazy, crazy examples of this. But along the way with all these relaunches, I benefited from understanding that you learn not even like twice as much 
from your failures, but 10 times as much. You know, you want to learn from somebody who's been there, seen there, and and has risen, right? And they're still fired up to help others. I also think that it's important as you are working to get your company, whether it's, you know, early six figures to seven figures to eight figures and beyond, there's always those, I call them gates, and you have a gate when you first hit your first six, you know, six figure business. Then you have another gate at about 250,000. Then another at half a million, 1 million, 2.5 million, 10 million. And what I mean by the gates is that there are different things that you have to know that you have to be as a leader in order to get past that gate. And it's kind of like this last weekend, I was at um, a ski resort here in Colorado and I have a certain pass called the Epic Pass. And I was going through this gate and it was not allowing me to go. So I was kind of leaning into it. I was going nowhere. Finally, the lady's like, can I see your pass? And of course, this resort was not the pass I had. It was a different pass. (laughs) And so think of that gate with your revenue. Those gates are not going to let you freely go forward unless you reassess what the next steps, what the next way of doing business, what your next identity of getting into that business is going to be like, which means you got to be curious and you got to allow for growth in order to do that. And so with me, I had a fear of, I knew I could scale very quickly at the beginning, but then I always hit this roadblock. I always hit that, the gate that wouldn't go up because I was carrying the wrong pass. And when I finally got through that, and it was through a, a process that has now, I now identify as tune in, this tune in and the stages, four stages of tune in. Once I was able to do that, I realized, okay, I can do this, but I was trying to, I was trying to jump over the gate. I was trying to leap over it versus having it open up because it naturally was in alignment with where I was as a leader. And so I think that that's probably a lot of people that I see that come to me are stuck at the gate. Have you read or heard of the book, Think and Grow Rich? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) A lot of what you're saying, that's actually the last book I read. So a lot of what you're saying, I'm like, that's in the book. I like, I've heard this before. You know what? Um, I love that book. Now tune in is not in the book. So can I share, can I share with with your audience what tune in is? (laughs) Absolutely. So there is a process that over the 20 plus years that I've been coaching and running businesses I've created, and it was, it's called three HQ and the H is our head, heart, higher self. And when you can get out of your head, when you can tap into your heart, you can align yourself with your higher self, which my definition is your best version of you. It could be your connection with God. It could be spirit, universe, whatever it is. But it's truly when you are being authentic, authentically you, okay? So 3HQ is where we all strive to be. It's not about IQ isolating from EQ, the emotional quotient, it literally is in today's world, a three HQ world. And how do we do it? We're all opening up to the concepts of, as we said, like law of attraction, uh, manifestation works. If you leverage it, if you know how to use it in your business, if you know how significant your intuition is as one of your greatest tools in your business, but a lot of people get stuck in their head and they can't even begin to think about anything else, but I got to do this, or this keeps happening to me, this negative thing. Why can't I, you know, yet another fear, 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 fear. And I recently in doing research for the book, there are over 500 phobias, 500, like pretty much anything out there people are, could be in fear of. And the biggest ones are fear of not being good enough, fear of not being worthy, fear that you're going to fail, fear that you're not going to be successful, fear that you're going to be too successful. And what will that mean to your business? And so when you think about that, there's a process that I call tune in. And the first step of tuning in is really looking at what isn't working for you right now. What's a challenge? What's a challenge that's going on? And can I ask you that? 
Can I, can I, can I actually coach you right now? Are you okay with that? Absolutely. Always open right. to it. Okay. Um, so the question was, what's the challenge for me? Yeah, what's the challenge that you're going through right now in your business? I would say taking on too much, not knowing where my priorities lie, or I guess not really no, or sorry, let me rephrase knowing what I'm passionate about, but trying to do so many things and not really following what I think I want to do. Oh, so good. So it's this taking on too much, getting distracted away from your passions. Yes. Okay. So now what I want you to do is the second stage is change your channel. And the way we're going to change your channel, because Einstein said, you can't solve a problem at the level it was created. And what that means is that when you are in challenge mode, when you are thinking something isn't working for you, you are in a negative level of energy. And in order to create, manifest, be able to have forward momentum in your own growth of yourself, of your company, we have to be operating at that level of a higher energy so that you can bring in whatever you're going for ultimately into your world. So what I want to do is by tuning in right now and changing your channel, I want you to think of a song that really elevates your mood. That when you think of this song, you're like, oh my God, I can, I can hardly not have my body move. Do you have a song? Um, it can be any song, but it just has to really light you up. Right now, just because it's so popular, it's the I'm good blue version. Okay. That's I'm the, good. That's the one okay. that's getting me going. <laughs> okay. So let's just call it I'm good. Work for okay. you? Yeah. So I want you to think of I'm good and you're going to play it in Dolby surround sound mm -hmm. in your body, in your mind. You're going to take it from your head all the way down to your feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I want you to turn it up a little louder. Okay. So now you're really, you're moving your body. You're changing your state, which we know is important. Okay. So can you feel this? Yes. All right. So now the stage three of this is if you weren't taking on too much and you were able to really focus in on your passion, what would that feel like? Tune into your song. I'm good. And what would that feel like if you were working with your passion so much of the day. Similar to this feeling, I think. <laughs> Tell me what the feeling is. <laughs> Share with what's going on. I see your big smile. I love that. I'm kind of just very grounded and like in the present moment. And it's weird. Like it feels like just a general vibe of like mm. elevation. <laughs> so good. So stage four now is tune back in. Here I'm good. Move your body again. And I'm going to ask you, what could you do right now for forward momentum on taking back and moving towards what you ultimately want in terms of taking on too much? Now, all of a sudden, you're not. You're focused on your passion. What could you do right now today to move this forward towards that channel? Ooh. Tune back in. <laughs> Tune back in to I'm good. What is it? Um, I, like practically, I would just say setting more time aside to like be intentional about my podcast work or my social media stuff. Um, rather than like forcing myself to do X, Y, Z, that's like not related. Okay. So your podcast and your social media puts you into that passion state, puts mm -hmm. you into your purpose state. Yes. <laughs> so today by saying, focusing more on that, how much time are you willing to commit to that today in order to get into and be a part and tune into that channel? Definitely a lot. <laughs> I give me, think. Give me a time. Give me an amount of time. Like today. Today. 
three hours. Ooh, is that a lot? <laughs> that's, but not it. But that's what came to you. Yeah. Here's the best part. So you're going to commit to whatever it is. What if it's thirty minutes? If it's three hours. But when you're doing it, you're going to constantly be tuning in like we just did, because that is a tool now that you have, no matter what you're doing throughout the day, when you tune in, when you change your channel, when you get into that state, that energy state, that's what you are attracting. Law of resonance, that which with what you want is what resonates with you. So you're resonating at a higher level. And that helps you to tune in instead of being tuned out with, oh, I'm taking on too much. I'm not doing this. I really want to be here, but you're not there. And so the tune in process gets you there every single day. And as soon as you start to realize it takes less than a minute, you're like, boom. Some people, now that you know it, you can go right to the song. You can have it on a speaker. You can have, you know, your four or five songs that you're your go-to songs before you do anything, before you go into creating a social media post or a story, you tune in because your audience, the people that are listening right now are tuned in at that level. Wow. I feel so Zen right now. And like, everything's making sense. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for going through it because I, it's just so awesome. And again, it's, it's simple. It's four steps and it just changes everything. And if you go back to Einstein, you know, we sit here and we try to, you know, push that square peg into the circle, jam it, jam it, jam it. It never works. But if you can elevate, and I'm a huge music fan, if you can elevate yourself, um, it, it's it's a game changer. What I just shared truly has changed people's businesses, and it's incredible. That's what I was just going to say. I love how you incorporate music into that because it's universal. Like the way music can make somebody feel is something that I think the majority of people can relate to. So I think it's such a great practice. And after what I just experienced, I think it's definitely something that will resonate with me and hopefully everybody else listening. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. I need to lock back in. I feel like I was just like so grounded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we wrap up today, I wanted to also ask about um, the Panini effect because I saw that um, through one of your channels and it's the concept of visible gratitude for anybody who doesn't know. So can you just talk a little bit about what that experience was and some of the domino effects that actually come with practicing gratitude? So what's so great is I just got chills because I'm in the same chair. I'm in the same place that the Panini effect happened. And that's when I shared it. When I was writing my book, I felt like I was, you know, a caged animal. I was sitting at this, I'm an extrovert. So sitting for me for long extended periods of time is really hard. And so I was sitting in my office. I was feeling sorry for myself that I was working every weekend. It was a beautiful sunny day. I remember looking outside and there was a buck that had these gigantic horns. And I just, all I wanted to do was go out and take a big hike and at that exact moment, there was a little tap at my door and my husband is standing there with a, I mean, ooey, gooey, cheesy panini with all these veggies in it. And it was just one of those moments. And normally if he does bring me lunch, I'm very like focused. I'm like, okay, thanks. And I'll go right back to work. This time I kind of looked at him and whether it was the sun coming in from behind him or, or whether it was the smell of this panini, it, it got me to really stop. And I looked at him. I'm like, I want to say thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for like, you know, bringing this to me for, you know, realizing I hadn't eaten for, you know, creating something that you knew I absolutely love. And I looked at it and I'm like, wow, at that moment, it was visible to me what was happening. I was visibly grateful. But what came over me was this invisible wave of just sheer gratitude 
of everything. And I, I became like, it was almost this like opening of my eyes where I, I started to just look out the window. I'm like, oh my God, and look what's happening over there and there and this, this stream of light and my husband. And I'm just like, oh, that's what it's about. It's about, we take things for granted. As you said, you know, taking on too much, you take on too much and we don't notice anything. We stop having it. it, it we, we, we stop having the visible happen even. And so I, I, with the Panini effect, it's about become invisible first, go inside. You know, our society right now is all about being as visible as possible, throwing yourself out there, posting, you know, stories, TikTok. I mean, all these things that just keep us in that busy, fast lane. But the real magic, the real happiness, the real ahas, the real calibration of life to where you ultimately want to go is that idea that if you can notice even the simple things like a panini being dropped off, how much once I did that, that afternoon, my writing was on fire. It was like, oh my God, this is the greatest. And it's when I actually came up with, in order to have things visibly show up, you got to go invisible first. I love that. I think it's so powerful. And especially the fact that you have a story to go with it is like just even more um, inspiring, I think. Um, but it's so true that when we do take a moment to like, again, ground yourself, make yourself aware of what's going on around you, like you can really see and feel the benefits of like just saying out loud, thank you. I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for the sushi I just ate. Like when you actually name those things and give yourself time and space to feel them, I think like what you shared, your writing got so much better. Like we do just kind of place ourselves in that higher position of self and power. So true. And once you start to realize that everything that you're thinking, uh, there's a great in Sanskrit, the word karma means come back. And that's, you know, what, over 2000 years old. And so think about what you are putting out. If you're putting out frenetic energy, like, oh, I got to do this. I'm so busy being busy. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. What do you think you're getting back? What do you think's happening on the inside in the invisible space? That's when you're like, no, I won't let it happen. <laughs> I like that. And one of the quotes I have on my lock screen right now says like, be the energy you want to attract. And I think that's like related mm. to the good karma, like what you put out into the world is going to come back to you in some form. So just really leaning into that. I agree. So great. Amazing. Well, before we go, I want to ask for one piece of advice that you would give to anyone who is looking to take a chance on themselves, either in life or in their career. Oh, so I would say, and this just came up yesterday, I was asked to give a quote and Maya Angelou, she said, and I don't have it right in front of me, but I remember reading it and I did look it up and it was about the butterflies. And when you think about, when you think about metamorphosis, when you think about going from a caterpillar to a butterfly, it's gnarly. You literally, you know, you, the butterfly or the caterpillar is eating itself and creating this whole thing. It's like a, a horror movie in itself, but what emerges is that butterfly and entrepreneurship. There is a lot of that, that metamorphosis that has to happen and it has to start with you. It has to start with the tough things. Like I said, the bugs, the beliefs underground holding you back you need to realize, and I believe that, you know, the quote really states that you can't compare yourself to someone's ending when you're at the beginning. And when you're going through those gates, right? Each gate is a new beginning. And so these people that you're like, oh, you know, why does it look so easy for them? Really? Or is it just what you're only seeing? You're seeing their ending. You don't know the struggles that it took to get there. And let me tell you, after working with thousands of entrepreneurs, there's not one, not one that I've worked with that hasn't had major struggles. 
I love that. I think it's so beautiful. The butterfly an analogy in any sense, like is always so mm -hmm. perfect, I think. So perfect. And it really just shows like evolution is kind of part of everybody's journey and like what the caterpillar looks like compared to the butterfly is like such a beautiful transformation of everything. It is. Um, so I like that you went that route. I think, again, it's an easy, simple thing that everybody can kind of relate back to where they're at in their own journey. Maybe they're at the beginning, somewhere in the middle, close to the end. But at the end, I think everybody's goal is to become that butterfly in some way. So Ooh, can yeah. I throw one other thing in? Absolutely. Because I just read this. And again, <laughs> I love I love like coming up with things. And then so last weekend I was reading that the monarch butterfly, I've been following the butterfly. I've gone to Mexico City and seen where all the butterflies go. It, it's incredible. It's like a snow globe of butterflies <laughs> when they all fly down there. But there's been this, you know, terrible effect where the butterflies are starting to become extinct. And this is the first year that they have now identified that it is picking up again and that there were 30,000 butterflies, monarch butterflies that have been identified. And so I do want to kind of take this back to entrepreneurship. Just when we thought the butterflies were going to be gone, they were able to figure something out that's changed the trajectory of where they're going. And that can be you in your business as you go through the gates as well. Mic drop. I love it. That's such a perfect way to wrap up this conversation. Um, but Hillary, truly, thank you so, so much for coming on here and for sharing all your knowledge and experiences with us. I love everything you're doing and just the wisdom you've had to share. Thank you for coaching me. That was a great little um, experience. And I'm definitely going to take the tune in practice back with me. Um, and I'll put all your links to socials, websites, and your book in the episode notes as well. So anybody who's listening can go check you out. Well, and another thing you can do, I have a great quiz that lets you know if you're in your head, your heart, or your higher self, and what type of entrepreneur are you? And you can go to the relaunchco.com and the quiz is right there. And it's the relaunchco.com. And so you can take the quiz and see where are you spending most of your days? I'm definitely going to do that right after this. <laughs> Very good. I'll be curious to see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you again. It was really fun.